Hi everyone, I am Pastor Dave Jensen and I'm glad to you could join us for this time together. This may not be a new experience for you to listen in on Facebook Live, but for me it's a brand new experience. And uh, the interesting thing about it is as I speak today, um, you are able to see my face, but I'm not able to see your face. And that might be a good thing. So, well, we are hearing all this about social distancing and those kinds of things to me, and that concept is very foreign to me. I would imagine it's the same for you. I enjoy being with people and exchanging handshakes and gestures of various kinds. In fact, I thought I don't ever want to get used to social distancing. Because, for one thing, it's the total opposite of what we try to do as a church and our church family to have a warm welcome and to have meaningful conversations and to just have close proximity to be able to talk. And I know the church is people, not a building. We're told in the Bible that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But for today, and at least for the next couple of weeks, we will assemble together around our phones and around our laptops on Sunday mornings at 1030, and we'll make the best of it. The other day, my mind went to the verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, where it says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. In fact, that text in chapter 3 goes on to say there's a time, and this is really interesting, there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain. And that's where we're at, I guess, right now. You know, none of us, none of us likes dealing with the coronavirus, this COVID-19 and all the concerns that come with it. It's affected everyone in so many capacities and and I surely feel bad for those who have been infected by the virus. I also feel bad for the shutdowns that have occurred through businesses and schools and churches and travel and all the dominoes that have come down during this time in our community and in our nation. But it's here and we need to rally together for the well-being of all people. And let me be quick to say this, did, this caught us all by surprise for sure. But God was not caught off guard again. He is still sovereign and he is giving wisdom to us all as to how to proceed in the days ahead. I really like what Craig Grishel said recently. He said, when you realize God is for you, you won't fear what happens to you because you know God is working in you. We need reminders like that. We need to claim God's promise to, to us, such as the one in John Chapter 16, verse 33, when Jesus says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we will get through this time, but we will need God's help to do that. And just maybe, maybe this will be a time for you to draw near to God as never before, to have a closer relationship with him than you've ever had in your life. Well, my message today is about living God's dream despite past poor decisions. And um, just to tell you up front, if you have the desire to have a copy of the manuscript of today's message, you can send an email to me at stortonbc at centurytel.net. That's S-T-O-R-D-E-N-B-C at centurytel.net. And when I get your request, I will send you that manuscript and uh, you will have that available to you. Last week, I started a series in our church entitled, A Time to Dream. And my message was about dreaming the future God wants you, or God wants for you. And in that message, I gave 12 reasons from scripture why you must know God's dream for your life. You know, God wants you to dream his dreams. God's given you the capacity to dream. In fact, without a dream, you're dying. As Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Everything starts with a dream. So you need to dream God's dream for your life. And one of those 12 reasons that I shared last week was that a dream keeps me going in tough times. Are we living in tough days? Absolutely. So today, one of the, I just want to get, reiterate one thing. 
Um, and I said this last week, God's dream for your life is always bigger than your dream for your life. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20 that God can do far more than you ask or think or even imagine. So today, before we go into the actual steps of discovering God's dream for your life, we need to consider the biggest barrier that will keep you from God's dream. Did you know that the number one barrier to your future is your past? It's your past because we tend to perpetrate the past. But your past is past. It's over. It's done with. A lot of people still try to live in the past. You can't live in the past, but you can live in the present and you can prepare and dream for the future. So today I want to look at, a, at just living God's dream despite poor past decisions. Because I meet people who say, you know, well, I think I maybe had my chance, but I missed God's dream. I had my chance, but I missed it. Now I'm on plan B or plan C or maybe even plan D. I don't deserve to have God's dream because I've messed up. I've messed up so much in my past that I don't even know if I should dream. Well, one reason we know that the Bible is God's word is because it, because it always tells us the truth. And so in James chapter 3, verse 2, this is what it says. We all stumble in many ways. We all are in the same boat. We all stumble. We mess up. We make mistakes. We sin. We have problems. We hurt other people. We even hurt ourselves sometimes. We all stumble in many ways. The Bible also says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Another way to say that verse is that all of us fall short of God's original dream for our lives. Does that mean your dreams are now on hold? No, it does not. And when you think about it, what's lost when we make poor choices? Well, we lose our vision, we lose our dignity, we can lose our identity, and we lose our peace of mind. A lot of stuff is lost from our poor decisions. We lose our joy, we lose our peace of mind. But the whole reason that Jesus came to earth was to recover and to restore that which is lost. We read that in Luke 19, verse 10. Part of what Jesus came to restore is God's original dream for you. He hasn't moved to plan B in your life. He still has plan A in your life. He still has his original dream for why he made you, regardless of what's happened in your life or what other people have done to you, or all the poor decisions that other people um, have made like you have. How do we live God's dream despite past poor decisions? Well, the Bible gives us a very clear pathway on how to get back on track, how to get back to God's original dream, even if you haven't been there for a long time. So, Number one this morning, recovering God's original dream for me. Just three steps for you to discover or to recover God's original dream for you. You may want to write these down. First of all, honestly accept responsibility for your poor choices. Nobody forced you to make the choices that you made. You chose to make them. The Bible says we've all stumbled in many ways. We've all made poor choices. So what this means is that I don't accuse others and I don't excuse myself, which is what we typically do. We look for other people to blame, just like Adam and Eve did all the way back in the Garden of Eden. They blamed each other. There's many examples I could give you in Scripture on why we make poor choices, but let me give you just one today. It's the time when Peter betrayed Jesus the night before he went to the cross. And he didn't just do this one time, he did it three times. Peter made some poor choices, and they're all found in Mark chapter 14. And even though they aren't excuses, 
I've, I've just kind of jotted down four reasons why we all make poor choices. These are things that contribute to poor choices. The first thing that causes us to make poor choices is pride. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples and he says, one of you is going to betray me. So one guy pipes up and says, no way, that isn't going to happen. Well, who says that? It's Peter. And so in Mark chapter 14, verse 29, he says, even if all fall away, I will not. Peter is setting himself up with pride. Elsewhere in the Bible, it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. I've kind of learned that the people who tend to brag the most about their confidence are also the ones who are the most likely to stumble. Anytime I start thinking I'm a hot shot, I, I'm dead in the water already. Anytime I start thinking that I'm invincible, I have a pride problem. Given the right situation, you and I are capable of any sin. If you don't believe that, you're already in trouble because the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things. You lie to yourself, and I lie to myself more than we lie to anybody else, maybe. Pride causes us to make dumb decisions. There's a second cause of poor decisions, which is fatigue. When you get tired and worn out, when you're stressed to the limit, when you're at the end of your rope, you're not in a place to make good decisions. The great coach Vince Lombardi once said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. You might remember before Jesus was arrested, he goes to his favorite place to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And while he's there, he takes Peter, James, and John with him, saying to them, you know, you guys come along with me. I just need you to be here with me while I pray. And so Jesus is there praying his heart out, and what happens? Peter, James, and John all fall asleep. And so in Mark 14, 37, Jesus wakes up these guys and he says, could you not keep watch with me for one hour? Just one hour. When you get fatigued, you're going to make poor decisions, poor choices. There's a third reason people make bad decisions. It's fear of disapproval. Fear of disapproval. When you start worrying about what other people think, that's going to cause you to make poor decisions. After Jesus is arrested that night, the Bible says in Mark 14, verse 54, that Jesus, or excuse me, Peter followed him at a distance. Anytime you follow Jesus at a distance, you're going to make dumb decisions. You've got to get as close to Jesus as you can. So let me ask you this today. Are you doing that? Are you getting as close to Jesus as you can? Or are you following him at a distance? When you worry about what other people think, you're always going to make the wrong decision. And then one other, the fourth reason we make poor decisions, and that is short-term pleasure. Short-term pleasure. Let's say you're getting ready for bed at night and and you, you're just thinking, you know, eating a banana split is probably not the best thing for me, but it would really be good while I'm eating. And what we do if we would go ahead and eat that banana split is we often go for the short-term pleasure instead of long-term health in that case. And this happens in a thousand different ways. When people overspend on their credit card and they go deeper and deeper into debt, they're doing it for short-term pleasure. They're saying, I've got to have it, and I've got to have it now. They're exchanging short-term pleasure for long-term pain. The example of Peter in Mark 14, verse 54 says, Then Peter sat down with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. You know, here Jesus is being arrested and tortured, and what is Peter doing? 
He's sitting with the enemy around the campfire. Why? Because it's convenient and it's comfortable. Now, there's a lot more reasons we, uh, as to why we all make poor choices, but four of those reasons are out of pride, out of fatigue, out of fear of disapproval, and because of short-term pleasure. So, as I have already said, the first step in recovering God's original dream is to honestly accept responsibility for my poor choices. Here's the second step to recovering God's dream for you. I humbly ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. Over in Psalm 51, we have David's prayer of confession after he had a guy murdered so he could steal his wife. If you don't know what to pray when you need to confess something to God, this is a great place to start. When we look at Psalm 51, it says this, beginning in verse 1, Have mercy, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And then in verse 10 of Psalm 51, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I don't know if you noticed all the things he asked God to do in those verses I read for you. He asked for God to have mercy for him to blot out my transgressions, for him to wash away all my iniquity, for him to cleanse me from my sin, and finally then to create in me a clean or a pure heart. And these are the things you can ask God to do in your prayer when you've committed any kind of mistake or sin or evil of any kind. I wanna just pause here for a moment before I go on to give you just three important reminders and really, if you get these, you've pretty much got the message, okay? Number one, there is no plan B for my life. You're still on plan A. God has not revoked his original dream for your life. It doesn't matter what other people have done to you or what you've done to others or what mistakes or poor decisions you've made. You're still on plan A. Secondly, my mistakes are part of God's plan. This one can really set you free if you learn it because you'll be free to dream and you'll stop thinking, I'm not worthy to dream because I've messed up so badly. There's a familiar verse in Romans 8, verse 28 that says, and we know, and we know, we know, we don't guess, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, or called according to his dream for them. So the, what's in the everything that he talks about in that verse? It's the good, it's the bad, it's the evil, it's the poor choices. Our God who created the universe can do anything, and he'll make it all fit together and all work together for good. Which means I can relax and know, okay, even my mistakes are part of the plan. And then here's the third reminder for you. God expects me to use my mistakes to help others. God expects me to use the troubles and the trials that come into my life, whether somebody else brought them into my life or whether I brought them on myself. This is what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Let me give you two questions to think about today. First question, what are the biggest troubles you've ever had in your life? What are the biggest troubles you had in your life? And then secondly, what have you patiently had to endure? 
Maybe it's a physical handicap. Maybe it's a mental handicap. Maybe it's a relationship that's broken. Maybe it's getting through the coronavirus pandemic. But once you've answered those two questions, ask yourself, how can God use those things that have troubled me or hurt me so that I can help others? God doesn't want you to waste your hurt. Do you, let me just say this. Do you realize that you help people more through your weaknesses than you do through your strength? I've got some really great strengths in my life. I've got some really great weaknesses in my life. And we all have a bundle of both of them, don't we? But God wants to use you, not just when you're perfect, not just when you're strong. God wants to use you now. God wants to use you in areas that you've been embarrassed about. And part of God's dream for you is to help people both in your strength and in those areas where you've experienced pain or trouble. And that's the power of the gospel. So we've learned already today, first, we honestly accept responsibility for poor choices. Secondly, I humbly ask God for his mercy and forgiveness. And then the third step in recovering God's original dream for me is to, I, to gratefully accept God's grace and forgiveness. Here's what we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. That verse is telling us that Jesus sacrificed his life and his blood on the cross to set us free, which means that all of our sins are now forgiven. So what's the daily implication of that? I think the daily implication comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 1, as it answers that. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You say, well, shouldn't they feel guilty? No, because there is no condemnation for all who are in Christ Jesus. So maybe you're struggling with your past which is keeping you from dreaming for the future. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I know I'm forgiven and that Jesus paid for all my sins on the cross, but I just can't forgive myself. Do you realize that when you say, I can't forgive myself, that you're really saying that you doubt the power of the cross? You're saying, I don't really believe God forgave me. And when you doubt God's forgiveness, then you're not going to forgive yourself because you think, I still have to pay for it. Well, you can stop nailing yourself to the cross because Jesus already was nailed to the cross. He was hung up for all your hang-ups. Well, secondly, I want to move in this morning and ask the question, why does my sin not invalidate God's dream for me? And for that, I want to just give you five quick reasons why no sin can invalidate God's dream for your life. First, because Jesus already paid for my sin. He already paid for them. They were paid for before you even knew God had a dream for your life. 1 John 2, verse 2 says it this way. He, meaning Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins that you haven't even done yet. He's already paid for all our sins. If you have to pay for your sins, it's saying that Jesus' death wasn't enough. So my sin does not invalidate God's dream because Jesus already paid for all my sins. Second reason that sin doesn't invalidate God's dream in my life is because God's goodness 
isn't based on my performance. God's goodness to you is based on the fact that God is a good God. It's not based on the fact that you deserve it. Listen to this verse from Titus 3, verse 5. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. It's not because I deserve anything. It's because he's a merciful God. It has nothing to do with me earning or working for it. It just doesn't work that way. And then there's a third reason why my sin does not invalidate God's dream for me. And that's because God's calling and gifts are given unconditionally. God has called you to a certain dream and to a certain purpose. He's given you gifts to fulfill that call in your life. And they are given without any conditions attached to them. If you had to work for them, they wouldn't be called gifts, would they? Romans 11, verse 29 reminds us by saying, God's gifts and his call are irrevocable and they cannot be withdrawn. You see, God's dream for your life is still in full force. You're not on plan B, no matter how many times you've blown it. God wants, you to, help, wants to help you live the rest of your life with that dream. It doesn't matter how late in life you're getting started on it. In fact, it's never too late to get into God's dream for your life. Then fourth, generously forgive those who have hurt me. You know, I like being forgiven. But I don't want to forgive anybody else. Not only do you need to let your own sin go, you need to let everybody else's sin against you go too. So follow me on this. There are three things in the past that will keep you stuck in the past. Things that will keep you from living God's dream for your life. They're all words that begin with the letter G. It's grief, guilt, and grudges. Grief, the losses in my past. Guilt, the sin in my past. And grudges, hurts from my past. Grief, guilt, and grudges will keep you stuck in the past. You've got to let go of your guilt. That's confession. You've got to let go of your grudges. That means forgiving other people. You've got to let them off the hook, just like God lets you off the hook. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15 is very clear about this. Jesus says, If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. He's saying there we can't expect to receive what we're unwilling to give. You have to let the people who hurt you off the hook. Not because they deserve it. They don't. They don't deserve it any more than God letting you and me off the hook. But you've got to let people off the hook so that you can get on with your present and your future days. Because as long as you hold on to a grudge, as long as you hold on to resentment, as long as you hold on to a hurt, thinking you're hurting them by your bitterness, you're being stuck in your past. And then finally, the fifth step is this. You need to courageously face the future with faith. Face the future with faith. In Job chapter 11, Job gets some of the best advice for recovering a dream, for recovering what has been lost in, in our lives. And this is what it says in verses 13 and following. It says, if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent or your house, 
Then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm and without fear. Goes on to say in verse 16, you will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only, only as waters gone by. Light will be brighter than noonday, and darkness will become like morning. You will be secure because there is hope. So we can courageously face the future with faith. The Bible is full of people who got a second chance. God is the God of second chances, the God of 100th chances, whatever chances you've had. God loves to give second chances. If you had to be perfect, none of us would ever stand a chance. So the dream is not invalidated by your sin. God still has plan A for your life. And then I, I just want to wrap it up today by giving you one other verse that I, I, I just love this text. It's found in Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. It says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? You know, the Bible says that, that we're to learn from the past. We're to, we're to celebrate the victories of the past. But we can't live in the past. You've got to let that go. We're moving into the future. It's time to dream. As John said in Revelation, I'm opening doors that no man can shut. And your future is waiting for you. Would you just pray with me this morning? Our God, you are good and gracious. Your plans never change. Our sins and mistakes cannot change your plans and dreams for our lives. But may we take steps of faith this week to follow you. May we not be held back by mistakes or sins from our past, but instead that we would press on to know you and to serve you. And on this day, if, if you've never opened your life to Jesus Christ, maybe you want to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, would you come into my life right now? I want to follow you. I want to trust you. I want to know your dreams for my life. I admit that I've committed a lot of sins in my life and I've made a lot of mistakes. I need your forgiveness today and every day of my life to go forward. And as you forgive me, dear Jesus, help me to forgive the people who've hurt me. Help me to step out in faith because of the victory you've won in my life. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you will go forward this week and dream God's dreams for your life. Your life is so much waiting for you. I thank you for listening today. I hope you'll listen in next Sunday at 1030 in the morning and Facebook Live again. We'll see you then.